So what does all this mean? Well, it means that Liverpool are loving life at the moment. They would come from behind to defeat Brighton. They are two points clear of Arsenal, three clear of Manchester City. We'll talk about the ramifications of this result regarding the title race a little later on. But first, let's welcome in Joey. Nader Manua joins us. Jan Aga Fjortov, who, who was at the game. Uh, Steve, I want to start with you. Uh, you used the word disappointing. That's exactly what it was from a neutral perspective. Yeah, and I think that was down to Arsenal. But at the same time, can you blame Arsenal for basically keeping a tight ship? Not really. The fact is, that defensively, they were absolutely outstanding, uh, as Arteta said. Uh, unfortunately for them, because they were so deep, whenever they did get the chance to try and get forward, you got 70 yards to go. I mean, that's not, that's not easy. And consequently, they really didn't produce too many chances of any real note. Um, they deserved their point for the way they, de they defended. Uh, but I guess if you're City, you're disappointed that you couldn't break them down. But the fact is, it's really difficult. You know, when a team that defends as well as Arsenal do are sitting on the edge of the box and there is no space, the only way you break them down is perfection. And today, City couldn't quite hit that height of perfection. Yes, they had plenty of the ball, but the final pass, the final decision, just that, that last little bit that would have been perfection just wasn't there. And that's why they never, never really created too many open chances. What an anti-climax, yeah? Yeah, it is. And, and often it is like when you, you're looking forward to big games like this. Uh, I guess it's all about storytelling. We could start by saying Manchester City is the first team who take points of Arsenal in 2024. We can start there. We can say that it's a tactical masterstroke for both of them, cancelling out each other. But for a neutral fan, it was a boring and a, and a dull football game. It, it, you showed some of the chances. Th that was all. Mm. I mean, a care chance was the biggest chance as Manchester City had. This is a, a team that have scored in 57 games in all competitions before this game. But I guess you have to give a, a big compliment to Arsenal. They seemed a, mit, a bit more grown up the last season. They, they did the right thing today. I see someone say, yeah, they, they put a block out there and it was, I guess it was 78, 22 in terms of possession. But I say, I tell you this, Arsenal did a great job today, kind of doing what they had to do to come there. There were some great performances there with Saliba, uh, Saliba and, and Gabriel, of course, at centre-halves. I think Martin Erdegaard works very, very hard in, in sometimes just pressing alone. So, uh, a big compliment to Arsenal as well, of course. Yeah, oh, Nathan. What, what, do you want, what do you want to say, Dan? Obviously, <laughs> from a neutral perspective, it wasn't the best of games at all. But I think listening to what Stevie said, listening to what Jan said and the two managers as well, you could see that defensively Arsenal were very, very solid. But I also, in my opinion, give credit to City because defensively I thought they were good as well. I think it ended up being one of those games where in the commentary in England, they were talking in that first half about the attacking play from Ben White, the attacking play from Vardio. Like the attackers from the other sides were being sort of taken out of the game as such due to the way that the other sides were playing. And not least of all of Arsenal because they've had the best defensive record to this point and they defend really well from the front. But every time City would break that press, I think Guardiola said in an interview afterwards, that all of a sudden got dropped back into a low block, drop in there with six players and the back four was so narrow at times that even, you know, Stevie, I think hit the nail on the head. To break down teams like that, you need perfection. Maybe you need a worldie from 25 yards out. But for City, that wasn't going to be the case today, unfortunately for them. But I think Arsenal themselves, I don't think the plan was to have 28% possession or whatever it was. But the fact is, and this is a lesson for probably all players and all teams, some of the most talented attacking players in the game of football have gone to a place like the Etihad and done more defensive work than they've done attacking work because they needed to. And if one of them would have let the side down, then, you know, this title race could have been completely done and dusted for them as such. So it's a shame it was nil-nil. But if you watch the previous two games between City and Arsenal this year, is anybody surprised? Just a little, a little thing I meant to mention. There was eight centre-backs on the field today. It's a lot. Mm. Eight centre-backs. Mm. I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. And, this, and four of these centre-backs were being asked to attack. So I guess we shouldn't be that surprised when we think that neither side could break anybody down because invariably there was no space in the middle. The ball kept going to the wide areas. And let's be honest, you don't want a centre-back on the ball in the wide areas, do you? So is it a surprise? 
I, I suppose overall, Arsenal, without a doubt, are the happier of the two sides here, yeah, Jan? Yeah, and it was a feeling. Uh, I interviewed uh, Martin Erdegaard straight after the game and I tried to get him out that he will be happy with that point. And he said uh, the, the proper thing that Arsenal players should say, yeah, but we wanted three points. But I saw how they kind of <coughs> secretly celebrated that point. I think that was very important for them to take that point and not give Manchester City three of them. So you could see also from the start, they, they slowed down the game. They, they play the ball longer. I think Stevie is making a very good point in terms of the centre-halves uh, and the number of them on the pitch. I think for Manchester City, Guardiola played a good, good game. I think that was his best game for, for Manchester City. But still, you kind of in saw in second half, and especially Manchester City, I mean, somehow they're slowing down the game and it's, there may be tactical reasons for that. But when a Grealish and Doku comes on the ball, you never see them going in speed one against one. So, so for Saliba and Gabriel being so good defenders as they are, they can only use the space to defend as well because there is no space between themselves and the goalkeeper anyway. So there's no place for any of the attackers for Manchester City to go into anyway. But I, I guess that's what they came to do and, uh, and Arsenal succeeded in doing that. The talk between Manchester City fans and Adam is, oh, this is Arsenal, a team that are trying to fight for the title, yet they come to us and they park the bus. To be honest, I don't think it was Arsenal's intention to part the boss. I think they would have accepted the fact that City would have had possession, but I don't think Arsenal would have wanted to come in with 28%. Otherwise, the personnel probably would have been different. Yes, there were lots of setbacks on the field, but he still had Odegaard, you had a Jesus, you had a Havertz, you know, you had a Saka. Like, Saka's memory of that game is going to be him mostly just tracking back and then one cross into the box and such. So, yeah, I don't think they necessarily part the boss, but this is Arsenal. Like, they have statistically the best defence this season. The nature of the chances they're giving up are far, like, they're far harder to score against than, say, other sides in the league at this moment in time. And it's because of that high press. It's because of the way the midfield follow up with them. But then in times when they're facing a bit of pressure, the organisation right behind them is great as well. I think City got to sort of face that today. I think in some ways I was happier to see the changes from Guardiola where he's bringing on a Doku and a Grealish and they tried to focus a bit more of sort of like pace out wide. I know Jan said it wasn't enough, which is kind of fair. But I think Arsenal, ultimately, they accepted this is the way that was going to go, the game was going to go. And I think that idea as well of taking a point, for me, it feels like the City game versus Liverpool a couple of weeks ago. Mm. Going into the game, City would have wanted to win it. But based on how the game went, you're thinking to yourself, let's just be glad that we can take something from this. And I think that was the case for Arsenal today. Because if they would have had more possession, more opportunities, I don't think a point in their mind would have, would have been something for them to be proud of. And Nadim, is there any... You look at that 90 minutes, I understand the way that Arsenal defend, make it very difficult to play the sort of football that Manchester City do. But were you not disappointed? There wasn't that little bit of spark from, you know, your match winners like Foden, like De Bruyne, like Haaland, like Silva. Yeah, I think there was disappointment as such. But again, the first two games between the two sides was very, very similar. I think they have a way of cancelling each other out as such. And in those three matches, we've not really seen a ton of individual brilliance. I'm talking about the community shield. The game at the Emirates, which um, Martinelli scored late on in with a deflected shot. And then this one here today. I think Foden playing off the left, I don't think it's his best position. I think at times he can almost become a bit too predictable in terms of how he's going to be approaching the game from that standpoint. And then Silver himself, I think there were times when he would come in and roam. And I think Doku, when he came on, he went past a few people. But it was that final ball. But it was always going to be an issue for them. Because as Stevie said, it's perfection that's needed. When you look in the box and you've got a Tomiyasu, you have a Gabriel, you have a Saliba... You've got a Rice waiting in there. You've got a Partey or previously before that, you had a Jorginho. You know, they put bodies in the right areas. They're superbly well drilled. So, yes, I was disappointed. But then also to mention, like, I think De Bruyne at this stage right now it doesn't seem to me like he's 100% mm. fit. There are elements of the game where he's probably frustrated that his impact isn't as great. But then again, when you play against a side like Arsenal, they won't really allow it to be an end-to-end -end game. And if you don't manage to get in front of them early doors, you know, they'll, they'll park up right in front of you but then also still have that potential threat behind as well. You know, I don't think we should underestimate the fact that Arsenal's manager is Arteta. You know, teams have tried to just basically block City off for, for years. And just that little extra piece of ability or know-how... Because he's been there. Well, he's been there and done it. You know, it's one thing to sit and watch videos, and, but it's another thing to know what's going on inside the players' heads. 
because he knows all the things that Guardiola is wanting them to do. He's constantly at them about little things and do this. And all this movement is all about getting, getting an edge. And so if you've got that sort of knowledge and you've got good defenders like Arsenal have, that is huge. That's the difference between losing a game and getting a point. Uh, let's talk about Erling Haaland, uh, shall we? Of course, hasn't quite put in the same sort of performances that we saw last season where he just captured all the headlines. In this game today clearly cut a frustrated figure for out. Uh, before we hear from Jan, of course, every day after these big games, we have digital features on our ESPN FC YouTube channel. This is what Stuart Robson had to say about Haaland's performance. I know that Jan Argofjordov won't like me saying this, <laughs> but I'm still very upset with what I see from Erling Haaland. If you want to be the world's best centre forward, you can't just base it on scoring goals. You have to be the all-round player. And when Man City are pressed high up the field and the goalkeeper has to go from back to front, the centre forward has to hold the player. He has to link up the play. And at the moment, I don't see him doing that. So that, that for me, is a slight weakness in Man City. Shall I comment on that, Dan? I would, I would love you to comment on that. Yes, please, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, well, listen, uh, first of all, let's, let's have the fact clear here. Uh, apparently, he scored 52 goals last year season without touching the ball. So that, that was a performance, by the way. But I, I agree that his hold-up play today wasn't good. Uh, you've seen when he came back from his injury that he maybe doesn't have... The, the, the kind of balance in his game, the timing that you need to, to get into uh, the game. But I think that it's, it's quite simple just to analyse him based on a game like today. He has improved his link-up play, we, but it's also a fact that his touches, uh, it hasn't, he, ha he doesn't have many touches uh, in a game anyway. <laughs> Listen, th this young Norwegian, he got 29 goals this season. He got 18 in the Premier League and so on and so on. And yes, we should compare him with himself last season. But I think that is, that is too simple. His link of play has been better. It, it wasn't good today. But we should also give a uh, compliment to uh, Saliba and Gabriel that did a great job on him today. And sometimes I think, and I said that earlier as well, sometimes I don't think Manchester City take the best out of him either because he needs that space and then you can't just have touches and touches and touches on the left side or on the right side. There is no space to go into. I think I would prefer my centre-forward to score goals. <laughs> I'd rather he did that <laughs> than be the greatest hold-up player, the greatest link player. The greatest layoff player, the greatest this, the greatest court penalty taker, the greatest set piece taker. I want my number nine to score goals. And, I, I, and it's really hard to argue with the guy who scores goals, because this guy scores goals. And if, I've got, and, and if I'm a coach and I've got a number nine who scores goals, my job is to get him the ball in areas to score goals. Exactly, so, exactly. So I, I understand what Rob was saying about the hold up and that and that. Right. There's not a team on the planet that wouldn't take this guy as a centre forward. Nadem? And, and, but, oh, sorry. No, I was going to say, I think the stuff that the guys are saying you know, is com completely fair. And I was, you know, last year listening, every time he, like, didn't score, I said, well, he only had five touches, he only had six touches. Like, 23 touches for Haaland feels like a lot. And I think as you looked at the stats as well, you're looking at six out of eight aerial duels and other things like that. You know, he was engaged in the game and he wasn't the best hold-up play, yes. But he's one of many people who've come up against those two centre-backs for Arsenal who are super competitive, aggressive, and have a midfielder that will come right in front of them to try and win the second ball as well. So it wasn't great at all. But then this is kind of the way that sort of City approach things at times. And I'm with Stevie. Like, if the guy's scoring goals and having opportunities, I think that's far more important than being a guy that can link it. Because... For the way that they play, he can come and link the play, but they don't have wingers who then sprint in behind into the space like nah, you see with Liverpool, sure. like you see with an Arsenal. So if he's going to be the focal point, he can be the final stage of that instead of being the piece before because it will lead to nothing. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm just, it's just interesting, uh, this discussion, because uh, when he scores 52 goals, his link-up play is not good. He doesn't have enough touches. And I think that, <laughs> like Stevie is saying, every manager will love his... We love your striker to score 52 goals. The thing is that as a striker, you live and die normally from crosses. 
Uh, when you see Manchester City today, and I watched it uh, with, with Foden coming in, they always come from inside. The Grealish, he will do one trick, go to the left, and then he will go right, and then he will kind of bend it in there. That is the worst crosses you can have for a striker. What you want as a striker is early crosses. Get a crosses in, or you play over the back. And Arsenal did well today, today so we shouldn't uh, disrespect Arsenal's performance today, which was, was brilliant. But this has generally been a, a problem with Manchester City, where they haven't done the crosses early enough. Stevie played with one of the best in the world, Ian Rush, back in the days. I mean, tell him if there didn't come early crosses, he would probably crucify them uh, uh, by not doing that. He will tell them, get me the ball early in. Don't look for me. Look for the space and get in there. And, and, and I'm just waiting. I saw Roy Keane, Roy Keane saying that he, he played like a League Two player. Well, 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 well. If a League Two player plays, scored 29 goals in a bad <laughs> season, then I would like to sign that player from the League Two, by the way. Uh, that's quite silly. If we can go down the history books of Roy Keane and that family, and uh, Jan exactly. Jan you, your top, you were saying, but we won't. I don't think we need to do that particularly <laughs> now. It's, uh, Jan Argafiotov <laughs> says that Pep Guardiola doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, meanwhile, Nate, if you take what a look, are you at... what are you saying, Dad? <laughs> well, that's Daniola. what I'm hearing. I'm hearing he's not Pep using Harlan Pep in the right Daniola. way. No, but it's a good, it's it's a good it's a bit. Pep he doesn't know what he's it. doing. It's fine. Leave it. um, why have City regressed so much when you take a look at their record? against those around them this season, Naden? That is quite simple. They're just no good. You yeah. know what I mean? It's yeah. a miracle they're in, char in this sort of title race at all. <laughs> well, yeah, it's because the that. fodder that you know is I mean? below it's them. But then I think, yeah, I think when I look at that, though, it did make me think, well, I wonder what the record of the other teams is like. And I look at a team like Liverpool, for example, and I'm not sure if their record's that much better. And that sort of makes you sort of see how competitive it is up there. I think Villa have been a bit of a dark horse in terms of getting results against teams. City obviously have blown some of those leads and not won some games which they've sort of been more comfortable in. But I guess that's, as I say, that's the way that it is. As I look at Liverpool, they drew with City twice. You know, they lost to Spurs. They've lost to Arsenal and I think drawn with Arsenal as well. Yet still, they are top of the league. So this mini league, it does matter, but isn't necessarily as definitive as at times we try and make it seem... And I'm sure Guardiola will be disappointed. He's lost some key figures across this season in terms of, you know, De Bruyne for that first half of the year, even the likes of Gundogan and Mahrez leaving at the start of the season. But as it stands, they're still in with a chance of getting it done. And if they do manage to get a couple of wins against the Villa, you know, against the Spurs, if something goes their way elsewhere, they could end up being league title winners again.